I want to look at just four poems this week. Uh, one of them is quite going to take a little bit of time, Keith Ode to a Nightingale. And the others I will look at in less detail. So I'm going to, I'm going to save the Ode to the Nightingale for the end and look at the others. Coleridge fairly briefly, Shelley fairly briefly, though it's a pretty long poem, and Whitman a little more depth than Keats in, in more depth. But Keats does people, causes people an awful lot of problems generally. So I'm going to start with Coleridge because this has that, that famous romantic image of the Aeolian heart. And I'm not going to read the whole poem. I'm just going to look at a few lines. Uh, just a couple of things. Cot means cottage, right? so it's gone like a little bed, like a military cot. It means cottage. And here is the metaphor of the harp in the second stanza, in that simplest loop placed lengthways in the classing casement harp. That's the Aeolian harp. There's a picture of that on the announcements page. Uh, so the idea which I mentioned in the other lecture, in the written lecture, is that, as he says in later in the poem, what if all of animated nature be but organic harps diversely made? Organic, you can read the word natural, right? growing over themselves with the word organic. So if all of animated nature, meaning that nature is alive, be but organic hearts diversely framed that tremble into thought, into your brain, as o'er them sweeps plastic, which means changeable and vast, one intellectual breeze. So the idea of the, ole the, the nature as a oleum heart is encompassed in this stanza. The breeze itself is, to put it in very simple terms, God talking to you or nature talking to you. And the Aeolian harp is like a radio. Right? Instead of thinking of an intellectual breeze, think of a radio wave. Radio hadn't been invented yet. And the radio wave is completely invisible to us, inaudible to us. We have no way of knowing the radio wave is there until we turn the radio on and then we realize these things are all around us. They're going right through us. They're everywhere, all the time. And so the breeze is an image of God talking to us or nature talking to us. And there's only one voice, right? The soul of each and God of all, right? The soul, your soul, and the soul of the tree, and the soul of the river, and the soul of the flower, and the soul of the deer, is all one soul. We're not individual souls. We're individual parts of the one soul. You see this idea echoed in Emerson. We want to hear this universal soul talking to us, and we hear it through nature, which is just different frames of heart, musical instrument. And that's, that's that image. The last thing I want to say about this poem, and there's much, much more to say about it, is that after this trip out into the uh, religious, philosophical, romantic, higher world, he is immediately brought down to the everyday, mundane, religious perspective of Orthodox Christianity. And he's brought back down to that by his wife, or I don't, I don't know, remember if they're married yet when he wrote this poem, that doesn't really matter, by Sarah. And um, this is one of the roles of women throughout literary history, is they're supposed to ground men in the everyday, whereas men want to fly off and in, go hear interesting things and, and go on adventures, and the women are always pulling them back home to responsibility and their their nine to five job and their you know watching over the family and all of that. Um, so this poem I used to present in in the week on women in literature, but I decided 
I'd rather put it here because of the image of the alien. I think that this last stanza is um, not believable. It's, if you really believed what we were saying in that last stanza, then there would be no point in publishing the poem. Basically, it's a recanting of the whole poem. Not completely unlike the final stanza of uh, Tam Shanter that we read last week. All right, so that's all I wanted to say about that. There's much, much more to say. And Shelley, Ode to the West Wind. I just want to point out a few things about Ode to the West Wind. First, notice that it's called an ode. It's spoken to the West Wind, not about the West Wind. And it's written in five sonnets. So it's, a, it's an ode and a sonnet sequence at the same time. He addresses the West Wind in the whole poem, but he invokes the West Wind in the first stanza, and the first stanza is has the dominant image of the leaf. And it functions like the first quatrain of a Shakespearean sonnet. And he invokes the West Wind again in the second stanza by thou, and the dominant image of this stanza is the clouds. He invokes, and it's like the second quatrain of a Shakespearean sonnet, he invokes the west wind again in the third stanza with thou, and the um, dominant image of this one is the ocean or the ocean waves. Uh, so we got the, the Mediterranean, the blue Mediterranean here. And, of course, the wind is something that blows leaves and blows clouds and blows the waves of the ocean. And so that's the relationship to the west wind. And he stops uh, invoking the west wind after the first three stanzas. And so the fourth and fifth stanzas, or sonnets, I should say, work like the two lines of the couplet of a Shakespearean sona, sonnet. Right? Um, and he brings back the leaf and the cloud and the wave from the first three sonnets and tries to think about if he were like those things. So remember the Aeolian harp that's blowing through all things with one intellectual breeze. Now the wind, the wind that's blowing through the harp is also blowing through nature and pushing the leaves and pushing the clouds and pushing the waves and it wants him to, he wants it to push him to be his inspiration brings up a theme we've been talking about all semester. We learned very early on that poets are not generally of the opinion that poetry comes out of them. They're of the opinion that poetry comes through them. They're the instrument and poetry is the wind. So in the last stanza, he starts, make me thy lyre even as the forest is. That lyre is the Aeolian harp. So, my leaves right, are brought back here. He recaptures the images from the first three sonnets. And he says, drive my dead thoughts over the universe. He's still talking to the west wind. So, he's asking to be the Aeolian harp, which is what all romantic poets want to be. They are the instrument through which nature or God speaks in their poetry is the speech of nature or the speech of God. The speech, the, the speech of God. All right, so I didn't want to spend a lot of time on those because I want to spend more time on Whitman and Keats and let you work out the details of those. And Whitman seems like a simple poem, and it really kind of is a simple poem, but the precision with which he uses language in this poem is really extraordinary. And there's more things going on than you might notice at first. And I want to point them out. So first, we always look at the grammar. And what we notice is we have one sentence. And it starts here. It ends here. There's the only period in the piece. And we have these parallel 
opening clauses, these when clauses. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room. So there's the four when clauses that he starts with. How soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out I wandered off by myself in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. The tendency of readers of this poem is to jump to conclusions and say, for example, that the astronomer is wrong and is misunderstanding the stars and the poet becomes frustrated with the astronomer's way of thinking about the stars and goes out uh, to enjoy his superior vision of the stars. There's something to that reading, but you can only maintain it if you maintain a division between the speaker of the poem and the poet. The poet Whitman knows one set of facts, and the speaker of the poem knows a different set of facts. Right? So Whitman is saying something, the speaker of the poem is not saying quite the same thing. Whitman understands what's going on, the speaker of the poem does not understand what's going on. Right? And it's very important that we understand that the speaker of the poem does not understand what's going on. So I want you to notice that from the point of view of the speaker of the poem, there is no criticism whatsoever of the astronomer. He's just relaying the experience that he has had. And we know that there's no criticism because he uses this word unaccountable. He does not know why he became tired and sick. And he's not frustrated with the speaker. He's not annoyed with the speaker. He's just listening and listening and listening. And the speaker is speaking to much applause. Right? Much applause. So everyone else in the room enjoys what the speaker is saying. And there's nothing wrong with what the speaker is saying. But this, the, when, I, when I say speaker in this sense, I mean the astronomer. I should keep those straight. There's nothing, nothing wrong with what the astronomer is saying. But the speaker of the poem nonetheless becomes tired and sick, and he does not know why. But, so I forget some air, I guess, because he is rising and gliding out now that makes him a kind of a, uh, a more natural being in the use of these words rising and gliding. He's moving like a, like a, uh, like a, like a, like the wind, right? like something pushed by the wind. I wandered off right? and, and he's moving well, like the stars, or more precisely, like the planets, because the planets are wanderers. I wandered off by myself, so by myself contrasts with the crowd, in the mystical moist night air, and from time to time. So he doesn't go up to look at the stars, he just happens to glance at the stars from time to time in perfect silence. So the silence wandering by himself, contrast to what was happening in the lecture room. The key to this poem, I think, is this word unaccountable. The astronomer is counting proofs, figures, columns, add, divide, measure. This is these are methods of counting. But he is unaccountable. And I want you to notice it doesn't say unaccountably, which is what we would expect, making it an adverb, but it says unaccountable, which is an adjective, meaning that the word modifies not became the verb, but I, the pronoun. 
So it's he that is unaccountable. But that sense of I don't know why is also there. Because right? it is also, we could say, an adjective being used adverbially, which we do sometimes. So, in fact, I would say that it applies to both the pronoun and the verb. And it works here, and it also works here. Whitman, however, knows what the speaker of the poem does not. Whitman knows that the frustration, or, or, or the sick, I shouldn't even use the word frustration, the sickness, the tiredness and the sickness is being felt because the way that a scientist looks at the stars contrasts the way that someone who is like the stars looks at the stars. And again, this is not a criticism of science. There's much applause in the lecture room. But the poet is different from other people. He's not suggesting everyone in the room should have stopped the plotting and go out and look at the stars for themselves. This works for those people, but me, the poet, the superior being. The romantic poets are superior to we run of the mill people. This person is set apart because he's more like nature and doesn't even have to look at the stars because he is just out there comfortably in the moment. Okay, so very important, and we haven't talked about this probably enough. We, I remember we talked about it earlier in the term that we have to distinguish between the voice of the poem and the voice of the poet. The voice of the poem is much more naive than the voice of the poet in this case. Okay, so now I want to go to the one that I want to spend the most time on, which is the Ode to a Nightingale, because this poem gives people a lot of trouble and very understandably. So we know it's an ode, means it's in difficult language, formal language, and it's to a nightingale, meaning that's who's being spoken to. And the stanzas are, are we going to see, um, very complicated. I, mean, I, won't, I won't analyze them, I'll let you analyze them if you're led to do that. But you can see that just from the first two stanzas that the structure of the stanzas is, is quite complicated. And uh, this probably should have come out to the margin. So I'll just read the stanza and one at a time. I'll read the stanzas and, and go through what they're saying. For this first one, picture the poet just in his backyard sitting at the breakfast table, or something like that. My heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or empty, dumb, some dull opiate to the drains. One minute passed, and leave words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. So that first stanza is almost designed to confuse us. It starts right in the midst of something, and we don't know right off what he's talking about. But this is what he's talking about. He's heard a nightingale. He can't see it, but he's heard a nightingale in the distance singing his nightingale song. Very pretty song. And he's reacted to it. So he starts with the reaction to what he's heard. And what is his reaction? His heart aches. He's heard nature speak. The bird is now your Aeolian harp. Nature is speaking through the bird and making the bird sing. And the effect of that song, which is the purest poetry, it's what a poet wants to reproduce 
in his or her work. The effect of that song is to make the heart ache and to make the poet feel drowsy numbness as though he had drunk poison or emptied some dull opiate to the bottom of the glass. So he picked up some mixture of, of laudanum and drunk it down till the glass was empty. So that's how numb he feels from hearing the song of the bird. And you might think, why don't you feel happiness and glee? Well, he'll explain this. First of all, he says, it's not to envy of thy happy lot. The bird is obviously happy. The bird is singing a happy song, and the poet is feeling sad. But being too happy in thine happiness. Now, why, why is that not envy? Well, we can talk about that if you like. But the poet doesn't seem to understand how the bird can be this happy. So there's a contrast between the poet's ability to take in what the bird's saying and the poet's understanding that the, poet, the bird is saying much more than he appears to be saying, or much more than the poet can take in. But thou, light winged dryad of the trees, the dryad is a, is a nature god, a nature spirit, would be a better word. In some melodious plots of beech and green, so of, of beech trees, um, and it's important that we don't see the bird. The poet never sees the bird. He only hears the bird. And shadows numberless. So seeingest of summer in full throat of ease. So there's two things there. The poet knows that the bird is singing about summer. And the poet knows how easy it is. Full throated. Complete. Using his complete song. And easy. So... Imagine, to put this in very simple terms, you're a guitar player, but you're not a very good one, but you love guitar music, and, and you hear, I don't know, Andre Segovia play the guitar, and you think, man, I would love to do that, and, it, and the music is beautiful, you know, I feel like crap because I can't do it, so I'll never be able to do that. The poet wants to sing the same thing that the bird is singing, and the poet feels he cannot. It's a lot of work for a poet to write a poem, but a bird just sings nature straight out. So in the second stanza, he pursues that idea that he would like to join the bird so that he can be the, the poet that he wants to be. Oh, for a draft of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora in the country green, dance in Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blissful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the forest dim. So we see, he wants not just wine, but a magic potion. The vintage is wine. It's been cooled in nature, deep in the earth. It tastes of, of flowers and the country green, of these natural things like a peasant dance and a Provencal song and sunburnt happiness. This is, this is nature distilled in a liquid. He wants a whole beaker full of it. And he wants, and he wants a great description of beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth from drinking the wine. He wants to just drink it all in. That I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade into the forest dim. So this is what the magic potion that he wants would do. It would allow him to leave the world without anyone noticing it and fade away and join the bird where nature is all in all and he doesn't have to worry about the things that block him from nature, that, that hide him from the things that a poet is all about. So he's going to pursue that idea in the third stanza, fade far away, dissolve 
and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret. Here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and litanied despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Right, so we see one of the things that keeps keeps away from joining the bird in nature. Right? That's the essence. That's the place you want to be. But we've got to live in this false, painful world that prevents us. So imagine someone says, um, "Listen to this new song that I found. It's it's beautiful. It's it's, it's extraordinary." But your mother's in the hospital, right? and, and she's on life support. And no matter how beautiful that song is, you're thinking about your poor mother in the hospital on life support, and you won't be able to enjoy that song as though you had no worries. So the bird has never known these worries. The bird is an image of the other world speaking through the veil to us. And has no idea the crap that we have to go through. In this world, we you know weariness and disease and worries. Here, men sit and hear each other groan because they're sick. And palsy shakes the sad few last gray hairs. Right? So, old people with no control over their limbs and their hands shake and their all their muscles shake. Where youth goes pale and spectre thin and dies, most people read this as a reference to tuberculosis, which killed his mother and killed his brother and would kill him within a very short time of him writing this poem. He died at the age of 24. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden eyed despairs. So right? Just to think. If you look around you in this sad world, makes you full of sorrow, so how could you possibly join the bird? Where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes. So he's talking about the beauty of a woman, and uh, a young beauty is extraordinary. You can think of Poe here because he's a contemporary. But, you know, people grow old, women grow old, their beauty fades. And new love, and love fades too, even when, when youth is maintained through just experiencing the same thing for a while, it becomes familiar and it's wonder, wonder fades. So new love can't pine at these lustrous eyes beyond tomorrow. It just doesn't last. It's wonderful, but it doesn't last. So now he's got himself into our real doldrums after the third stanza, but he's going to lift himself up, away, away, for I will fly with thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered round by all her starry face. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. So he says, I will fly with you, despite all. I will not be sent there by wine. Bacchus is the god of wine and revelry, and his pards, the leopards that pull Bacchus's slice. So I'm not going to get drunk on that stuff I mentioned in the second stanza. Instead, I'm going to go on the viewless, which means invisible, wings of poetry. I'm going to use poetry, in fact, the very poem that you're reading, to help dissolve me out of this world and send me into the world of the bird. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, right? This is a reference where this is a reference to uh, to this line. But bunch of thinkers to be full of sorrow. Already with thee, so he's made it. Already with thee, tender is the night. So from this point on, for a while anyway, he's with the bird in nature, through his imagination, through the power of poetry. And by chance, the queen mood is on her throne, clustered around 
by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, and this is such a beautiful image, save what from heaven is with the breeze is blown. So imagine light that is blown with a breeze. It's a little bit like a, like a moving spotlight. But think of light as something that moves like wind. It's such an interesting image. Uh, through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways through nature. So now we're in the in the fifth stanza, and we're experiencing life with the nightingale. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass the thicket and the fruit tree wild, the hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child becoming muskrose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt that flies on summer eaves. So he cannot see what flowers are at his feet, but that's good because he feels, right, when his sense of sight fades away and doesn't work anymore, his other senses are heightened. And so this is an image of getting further into nature. Embalmed. Now, unfortunately, this word has changed meaning to such an extent that, it's, that it really confuses people. Embalmed means comforting. Uh, so in comforting darkness, guess. And guess has the suggestion of intuit. Know without your senses. I just know it. So he's, he, he could not be more in, in, in trapped, or you know, entrapped is not a good word, in, 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 in enclosed in nature than he is in this stanza. And he can tell what all the flowers are, but he can't see them. Darkling, I listen. I want you to remember this word darkling because it'll come up again this semester. I, I also want to say this this poem is so powerful and so important in the history of English language poetry that from this time on it's almost impossible to write about a bird without reference to this poem, whether you want it or not. And every poet knows that. Darkling, becoming dark. I listen, but then the dark is good. And for many a time, I have been half in love with ease for death. Now, why would you be in love with death? Because death can keep, take you out of this world into the other world, permanently. Calls him soft names and many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. While thou art are pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. This is the bird. He's still in his backyard listening to the bird physically, but emotionally he's left this world altogether. Still wouldst thou sing. You would sing continually. And I have ears in vain because I would be fading out of this world to thy high requiem become a sod. You would not be able to hear the bird anymore with his physical body because his physical body would be dead. He'd just become dirt. Now, these, these lines, I have to say, have always... I've never felt satisfied with my reading of these lines, so I'm, I'm just going to confess that to you. And let you decide whether you want to enlighten me or not. Um, but I've always felt they kind of jarred a little bit with the rest of the poem. So now he's musing in, in uh, what's this, stanza seven of the poem, musing on what he's just experienced, or musing on the bird. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, because this is not the physical bird. This song has always been the same. One nightingale is the same as any other one. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home she stood in tears among the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seeds in fairylands, 
forlorn. So uh, he's thinking of all the times and places in history, real and imagined, where the bird song would have been the same. Ruth is a book in the Old Testament and a character from the Old Testament. You can look her up if you like. Um, the emperors and the clown. Clown means common person, country person, a farmer, for example, would be a type of clown in that old sense of this word. But this word, this bird has been, the song of this bird has been heard throughout history, everywhere, and has done its magic. It has charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairylands in forlorn fairylands. Now, now remember, he's gotten to the bird through the vehicle of this poem. And the poem is also going to destroy his illusion to having been hanging out in this ideal realm of the bird. Because as soon as he says the word forlorn, something happens, the magic breaks. Forlorn the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is fain to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music, do I wake or sleep? She's so going to end in confusion. So two things happen. He says the word forlorn, that wakes him up. Um, I once saw a movie starring Christopher Reeve and, oh, I forgot her name, Jane something, uh, called Somewhere in Time, which is also based on a book. I think it's called Somewhere in Time, which is a very different book. Um, but it, the one thing they have in common is this idea that you can sort of mentally imagine yourself back into time. And if you completely believe you're in the past, you will wake up in the past. But if you're reminded of the present at any point, the illusion is broken, and you might never be able to get back there. Jane Seymour was the other, uh, was the actress. And in this movie, Christopher Reeve pulls a penny out of his pocket, and he's in like, I don't know, 1880 or so, and the penny says 1980, and, and as soon as he sees the penny, he loses the love of his life, and he is thrust into the future. Well, it can't be 100 years, because of what happens later, but anyway. Um, he, he loses the love of his life because he sees this penny. Well, in this poem, he says the word forlorn and it thrusts him out of his magical attachment to nature, to the bird, to the source of the wind of the alien heart. And at the same time, the bird flies away. The bird they've never seen, but the song flies away at the same time. And now he's confused. And here are the important lines. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do. The fancy is the imagination, and in the full romantic sense of that word, the imagination. In other words, the power by which you experience the truth of the, of the world. In this case, the song of the bird, the wind of the intellectual breeze. The fancy, the imagination cannot deceive me. We thought that the imagination, which is what creates poetry, could bring us into the essence of being. But no. So it's kind of an anti-poem. My poetry failed. The job of my poem was to awaken my imagination to get me into the real essence of being, but it didn't work. And the bird flew away. And so he's la la left with, with really a sad confusion. Was it a vision? Or was it a daydream? It's very important. Did I really experience being or nature in its essence? Or was I just pretending? The music is gone. So right now, am I really awake or am I really asleep? To put it in terms that might help you understand better, 
right now as you listen to me read this lecture, are you awake or are you asleep? If you are awake, then this is it. It's all an illusion. And if you're asleep, then you will wake up someday after death or when your imagination is most active and you will enter the true reality. Romantics all believe that behind this world or in some other dimension around this world close enough to touch but too far too too, too different in, in its essence to actually know that you're touching it somewhere out there is the truth it's just on the other side of this invisible veil and it's everywhere but we can't touch it we can't know that we're touching it we can't experience it Keats is wondering whether that romantic vision is really true or just an illusion. And he won't answer the question. What happens after we die? Well, the only way to know that is to die, and if there's nothing there, you won't know it even then. That's the dilemma of this poem, and it's a problem or an issue in much romantic poetry. So that's by no means to exhaust this poem, but that's to give you a deeper sense of it than you could probably come up with in such a short time on your own. I'll end with just this thought. I read this poem for the first time somewhere around 1980, and I didn't have a clue what it was talking about. It was, it might as well have been Swahili, for all I can tell. But, in fact, it, it makes perfect sense. All right, in the next week.